guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we will be doing part 2 of the IBD series and we'll be talking about ulcerative colitis. So let's get started. So what is ulcerative colitis? Ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel disease that causes long-lasting inflammation and ulcers which are sores in the digestive tract. Ulcerative colitis affects the innermost lining of the large intestine and usually affects the lower section, which is called the sigmoid colon, and the rectum. But this disease can also affect the entire colon. Ulcerative colitis can be debilitating and sometimes can lead to life-threatening complications. So we got a lot of information from that little definition of the disease. And if you look at my top right corner, you can see this little picture of the anatomy of the large intestine. And we said that it most commonly affects the sigmoid colon and the rectum, which is these two bits here. But it can also affect any part of the large colon. We also said in that definition that it affects the innermost lining or the mucosa. So from innermost to outermost, we have the mucosa, submucosa, muscular, and then serous layer. So ulcerative colitis usually affects just this inner lining of the colon. So this is going to be inflamed red and with a lot of tiny little sores or ulcers within it. And below I just put in a picture of what the evolution of the disease looks like from a healthy colon to moderate colitis and then severe colitis. So what are the causes of ulcerative colitis? The exact cause of ulcerative colitis remains unknown. Previously, diet and stress were suspected. These are part of the environmental contributors but now we know that these factors may aggravate but don't actually cause the disease. Recent findings show that the disease might be caused by the immune system overreacting to normal bacteria in the digestive tract or to some kinds of bacteria and viruses passing through the GI tract. Studies have also proven that one is more likely to get ulcerative colitis if other people in their family suffer from the pathology. So if you look at these three contributing factors. We have the environmental triggers such as diet and stress and then we have the genetic predisposition which comes from family prevalence and then we have the immune system component which means that the immune system attacks and destroys self cells or cells that are actually part of the GI tract and are needed. So this is a sort of an overreaction and it's an abnormal process. So any of these three factors may contribute towards the development of the disease so it's hard to sort of pinpoint an exact cause. Risk factors. Ulcerative colitis affects the same number of women and men, making the male to female ratio one to one. Risk factors may include age. Ulcerative colitis usually begins before the age of 30, but it can occur at any age and some people may not develop the disease until after the age of 60. Race or ethnicity. Although whites have the highest risk of the disease, it can occur in any race. If one is of Jewish descent, the risk is even higher. Family history. One is at higher risk if one has a close relative, such as a parent, sibling or child with the disease. Isotretinoin use. This is a medication that is sometimes used in the treatment of acne, and some studies suggest that it is a risk for IBD. But a clear association between ulcerative colitis and isotretinoin has not yet been established. The signs and symptoms of ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis symptoms can vary depending on the severity of inflammation and where it occurs. Patients can present with fresh blood or blood-stained mucus either mixed with the stool or streaked onto the surface of a normal or hard stool tenismus. Urgency with a feeling of incomplete evacuation with abdominal pain. With proctitis or proctosigmoiditis, proximal transit slows which may account for the constipation commonly seen in patients with distal disease. So I just want to pause there and go over to this diagram. And proctitis basically means the inflammation that affects just the rectum area. And this little drawing here, labeled A, shows proctitis, which is just the inflammation of the rectum. And then we have proctosigmoiditis. And this is basically the inflammation or an ulcerative colitis involving both the rectum and the sigmoid as well as part of the descending colon. And then we may have pancolitis which is the inflammation of the entire large bowel. So if the disease affects all parts of this large bowel it'll be called pancolitis. So going back to our bullets, when the disease extends beyond the rectum blood is usually mixed with stool 
A gross bloody diarrhea may be noted. Colonic motility is altered by inflammation with rapid transit through the inflamed intestine causing abdominal pain and cramping as well as weight loss and fatigue. When the disease is severe, patients pass a liquid stool containing blood, pus and fecal matter. Diarrhea is often nocturnal and or postprandial. Patients also suffer from fatigue, fever and young patients, which mean children, will show a failure to grow. The extraintestinal manifestation of the disease. So something to note about ulcerative colitis is that in addition to its primary intestinal manifestation, which means those sites of inflammation and ulcers in the colon, we also have some extraintestinal manifestations. About a third of patients with IBD also have extraintestinal manifestations involving rheumatological, cutaneous, ocular, vascular, hepatobiliary, renal, and skeletal systems. Arthralgia and arthritis are the most common extraintestinal symptoms and may involve both axial and peripheral joints. Joint manifestations may precede GI tract disease, so inflammatory bowel disease should be in the differential diagnosis of isolated arthralgia or arthritis. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis are associated with an inflammatory bowel disease. So in my picture below, these are examples of those associated extraintestinal manifestations. So we have a pyoderma gangrenosum, erythema nodosum, which basically means these red sort of nodules that develop on the skin. We have iritis or uveitis, which means an inflammation of the iris or the uveal layer of the eye. We can also have aphthous ulcers, which can occur in the buccal mucosa of the tongue and the palate. We can also have oral candidosis. Here we have an example of sclerosing cholangitis. And finally, we can have arthritis or arthralgia, which means joint inflammation. The macroscopic features of the disease. About 40 to 50% of cases are limited to the rectum and the rectosigmoid region. 30 to 40% extend beyond the sigmoid, but do not involve the whole colon and 20% of people have total colitis. So as you can see by these stats, most of the patients present with a disease that is localized within the rectum or the rectosigmoid region. When the whole colon is involved, the inflammation extends one to two centimeters into the terminal ileum in 10 to 20% of patients. This is called backwash ileitis and is of little clinical significance. So just to pause and go down to my picture below, this is the beginning of the large colon. So this is this part right here. And this is the ileum. And the ileum is the last portion of the small intestine that connects with the large bowel or the colon. And in some of the patients who suffer from ulcerative colitis, in addition to that colitis affecting the first portion of the large bowel, it may also affect the last portion of the small bowel. Ulcerative colitis affects only the inner lining of the colon, the affected area is usually continuous and the rectum is almost always involved. So these lesions are continuous. So if it affects this whole area, it will affect this entire area without skipping any lesions in between. And this is how it is different from Crohn's disease because Crohn's disease has the so-called skip lesions where it doesn't affect a continuous part, but it affects a few parts here and there. Biopsies from normal appearing mucosa are also usually abnormal. Thus, it is important to obtain multiple biopsies from apparently uninvolved mucosa, whether proximal or distal, during endoscopy. Continuing with macroscopic features, mild inflammation can be seen, the mucosa becomes erythematous and has a fine granular surface that resembles sandpaper. In more severe disease, the mucosa is hemorrhagic, edematous and ulcerated. In long-standing disease, inflammatory polyps called pseudopolyps may be present as a result of epithelial regeneration. The mucosa may also appear normal in remission, but in patients with many years of disease, it appears atrophic and featureless and the entire colon becomes narrowed and shortened. Patients with fulminant disease can develop a toxic colitis or megacolon where the bowel wall thins and the mucosa is severely ulcerated. This may also lead to a perforation. So in my picture on the right, you can see what the normal colon looks like. This is the histological specimen and this is the colonoscopy view. And in ulcerative colitis, you can see the vast difference in the two images. 
from this normal smooth lining mucosa you can see these alterations this redness and in the histology you can see it's complete chaos here there's no form of proper crypt arrangement and finally down below in this image you can see the development of pseudopolyps and these pseudopolyps are a result of epithelial generation which basically means that the mucosa is trying very hard to heal itself but it's unable to return to its normal appearance so now let's talk about the microscopic features of the disease histological findings correlate well with the endoscopic appearance and clinical course of ulcerative colitis the process is limited to the mucosa and superficial submucosa with deeper layers unaffected except in fulminant disease. Ileal changes in patients with backwash ileitis include villus atrophy and crypt regeneration with increased neutrophil and mononuclear inflammation in the lamina propria and patchy cryptitis and crypt abscesses. So in those patients who suffer from backwash ileitis, they will have the development of these crypt abscesses or cryptitis and that will develop in that terminal portion of the ileum. So how is ulcerative colitis diagnosed? Blood tests, and this will help us to check for an anemia. Because these patients suffer from chronic inflammation and ulceration, those ulcers and inflamed areas tend to bleed out. And when they bleed out a lot, our patient is going to suffer from some degree of an anemia. So that will be able to be picked up on the blood test. A stool sample, White blood cells in the stool, as well as blood-stained mucus, can indicate ulcerative colitis. A stool sample can also help rule out other disorders, such as infections caused by bacteria, viruses, and parasites. A colonoscopy. This exam allows the doctor to view the entire colon using a thin, flexible, lighted tube with an attached camera. During the procedure, the doctor can also take small samples of tissues, which are called biopsies, for laboratory analysis. Sometimes a tissue sample can help confirm the diagnosis. Flexible sigmoidoscopy. In this procedure, the doctor uses a slender, flexible, lighted tube to examine the sigmoid. So remember again, we said that sigmoid is this portion. Uh, it's shown in green here, an example of the sigmoidoscopy. So it's basically this is a sigmoid colon. To examine the sigmoid, the last portion of the colon. If the colon is severely inflamed, the doctor may perform this test instead of a full colonoscopy. X-rays. If one has severe symptoms, the doctor may use a standard X-ray of the abdominal area to rule out serious complications such as a perforated colon. CT scan. A CT scan of the abdomen or the pelvis may be performed if the doctor suspects a complication from ulcerative colitis or inflammation of the small intestine. A CT scan may also reveal how much of the colon is actually inflamed. So now let's talk about the treatments and drugs in ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis treatment usually involves either drug therapy or surgery. Anti-inflammatory drugs are often the first step in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. They include the aminosalicylates, most commonly 5-SA or 5-aminosalicylic acid, which is also called mesalazine, and sulfasalazine. Another first-line treatment for ulcerative colitis are the corticosteroids, these drugs, which include prednisone and hydrocortisone, help to reduce the inflammatory process. Immune system suppressors. These drugs suppress the immune system response that starts the process of inflammation. Immune suppressant drugs include azathroprine, cyclosporine, infliximab, and pedolizumab, and are commonly used to treat people with ulcerative colitis who are no longer responding to corticosteroids. Other medications. One may need additional medications to manage specific symptoms of ulcerative colitis. These include antibiotics. People with ulcerative colitis who run fevers will likely take antibiotics to help prevent or control infection. Anti-diarrheal medications. For severe diarrhea, loperamide may be effective. Something to note is that the anti-diarrheal medications are used with a great caution because they may increase the risk of toxic megacolon. Pain relievers. For pain, acetaminophen can be administered. And finally, iron supplements. If one has chronic intestinal bleeding, one may develop an iron deficiency anemia, and here iron supplements can be given to help with the treatment. Surgery. Surgery can often eliminate ulcerative colitis, but that usually means removing the entire colon and the rectum with a procedure called a proctocolectomy. In most cases, this also involves a procedure called ileoanal anastomosis that eliminates the need to wear a bag to collect the stool. 
The surgeon will construct a pouch from the end of the small intestine. The pouch is then attached directly to the anus, allowing one to expel waste relatively normally. In some cases, a pouch is not possible, and instead, surgeons can create a permanent opening in the abdomen, called an ileal stoma, through which stool is passed for collection in an attached bag. Cancer surveillance? One will need more frequent screening, by means of a colonoscopy, for colon cancer, because of the increased risk. The recommended schedule will depend on the location of the disease and how long one has had it. So now let's talk about some of the complications of ulcerative colitis. The first one being a massive hemorrhage. Only 15% of patients with ulcerative colitis present initially with catastrophic illness. Massive hemorrhage occurs with severe attacks of the disease in 1% of patients and treatment of the disease usually stops the bleeding. If bleeding persists, an emergency surgery will be required. And if the patient requires 6 to 8 units of blood within 24 to 48 hours, a colectomy is indicated. Another complication of ulcerative colitis, toxic megacolon. Toxic megacolon is defined as a transverse or right colon with a diameter of more than 6 cm with a loss of prostration in patients with severe attacks of ulcerative colitis. It occurs in about 5% of attacks and can be triggered by electrolyte abnormalities and narcotics. About 50% of acute dilations will resolve with medical therapy alone, but urgent colectomy is required for those that do not improve. Another complication of ulcerative colitis is a colonic perforation. Perforation is the most dangerous of all the local complications. Something to note is that the physical signs of peritonitis may not be obvious, especially if the patient is receiving glucocorticoid therapy. Although perforation is rare, the mortality rate for the perforation complicating a toxic megacolon is about 15%. In addition, patients can develop a toxic colitis and such severe alterations that the bowel may perforate without first dilating. Another complication of ulcerative colitis is the colonic strictures. Strictures occur in about 5-10% to of patients and are always a concern in ulcerative colitis because of the possibility of underlying neoplasia. Although benign strictures can form from the inflammation and fibrosis of ulcerative colitis, strictures that are impassable with a colonoscope should be presumed malignant until proven otherwise. A stricture that prevents passage of the colonoscope is an indication for surgery. And finally, the perianal complications. Ulcerative colitis patients occasionally develop anal fissures, perianal abscesses, and hemorrhoids, but the occurrence of extensive perianal lesions usually suggests Crohn's disease, and only a few cases are associated with ulcerative colitis. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this very informative. Please make sure you hit that subscribe button, like, comment, and share. And if you would like to download a copy of this presentation, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.